Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Brood Awakening event. In these strange times, we are able, through the benefits of modern technology, to meet together virtually, if not in person. And I do hope you enjoy tonight's service. At the end of each awakening, we usually meet together at the back of church to share drinks, donuts, and thoughts. Obviously, this isn't possible tonight, but please feel free to press pause, make a drink, get comfortable, and hopefully enjoy the evening. Our speaker tonight is the Right Reverend Bishop Michael of Litchfield, and he will be speaking on hope in the pandemic. So, I'd now like to start the evening with a short prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for your Son, Jesus. Through him we get to enjoy a great future. But Lord, we go through so many trials that leave us feeling discouraged and hopeless. In these difficult times, we sometimes lose hope in the great future that you have promised. Give us hope and strength that we may be able to stand in faith and continue to walk in your ways. In Jesus' name, I believe and pray. Amen. It's now my great pleasure to invite our vicar, Phil Moon, to lead our worship tonight. We've chosen two great songs to start with that are what I would call awakening standards. And so I would ask everyone to join in and sing along. Instead of all singing together in church, we can sing all over the villages of Brood and Bishop's Wood and worship our God. Phil, over to you. Let's sing praises to God with joy. The words of the song will appear on the screen. Sing like me. 
Tonight's reading is taken from Luke chapter 19, the story of Zacchaeus. Jesus went into Jericho and was passing through. There was a chief priest who lived there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was very rich. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was such a small man, he couldn't see because of the crowd. So he ran ahead of the crowd and climbed into a sycamore tree so that he could see Jesus, who was passing by that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw Zacchaeus. Hurry down, Zacchaeus, I must stay in your house today. Zacchaeus hurried down and welcomed him with great joy. All the people saw it and started grumbling. This man has gone as a guest to stay in the house of a sinner. Zacchaeus stood up and said, listen, sir, I will give half my belongings to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone, I will pay back four times as much. Jesus said to him, Salvation has come to this house today, for this man is also a descendant of Abraham. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. It's my great pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, the Bishop of Lichfield, the Right Reverend Michael Ipgrave. Bishop Michael graduated from Oxford with first class degrees in mathematics and theology. He then completed a doctorate at Durham University, which included a focus on interfaith dialogue. He's married to Julie. They have three grown up children and one grandchild. Bishop Michael and his wife enjoy going for long walks in the Staffordshire countryside and that includes pilgrimages around the diocese. He started his ministry with a curacy in Oakham, followed by some time in Japan. He was team vicar in Leicester and archdeacon, 
Archdeacon of Southwark Cathedral. He then became Bishop of Woolwich before being made Bishop of Lichfield in 2016. He's still very active in interfaith relations and was at one time interfaith relations officer to the Archbishop's Council. Bishop Michael is indeed the 99th Bishop of Lichfield and St Chad of St Mary and St Chad fame was the first. What a wonderful CV he has. Bishop Michael is speaking to us tonight on hope in the current situation. We are really very lucky to have him with us tonight and I am looking forward to listening to what he has to say to us. Bishop. It's really good to be with you and I'm very grateful to Phil for the invitation to share in this brood awakening as we particularly look at the story of Zacchaeus in Luke's Gospel chapter 19 as a sign of hope for us all. Uh, when Phil wrote to me about this he said could you talk about the episode where Jesus encounters Zacchaeus or is it the other way round? And I think that very question points us to the fact that though this seems um, quite a simple story and a very attractive story, um, I think a close reading shows that it is quite subtle and there are deep layers of meaning within the story of Zacchaeus meeting Jesus, of Jesus meeting Zacchaeus, and those layers of meaning are all full of hope. It's been one of my favourite um, gospel stories since I was a boy, so quite a long time now, um, and I really look forward to just reading through this with you and seeing what falls out for us as a message of hope. And I want to do that by um, asking four questions really. First of all, who is Zacchaeus? Um, secondly, what happens? Then what is going on at a deeper level? And what hope is there for us here? So first of all, who is Zacchaeus? Well, I think Luke paints a picture of quite a complex person, a person, if you like, full of paradoxes. Let me explain what I mean by that. First of all, um, Zacchaeus is a rich man. The gospel is very clear about that. And you have the sense that he is rich in possessions, certainly. Uh, he's a tax collector, not just any old tax collector. He's a chief tax collector, and that would have brought him considerable wealth. And he's a chief tax collector in Jericho, which itself was a rich city, a major trading city, particularly in the balsam trade of that time. But he's not only rich in possessions, Zacchaeus is also a personally resourceful person, I think, uh, rich in talents, rich in ability to think. We'll see a bit more about that later. So he's rich, but at the same time, it's clear from the gospel that Zacchaeus feels that he's lacking something, lacking something important. And that's confirmed for us at the very end of the passage where Jesus describes Zacchaeus as one of the lost, those whom he has come to seek and to save. So he's rich and he's lacking. He's got a very high profile, the office of chief tax collector Architolones would have made him a very important man in the city. But again, as you read this passage, it also feels that Zacchaeus is kind of on the edge of everything. And though he may have a high social profile, physically, Luke is careful to tell us that he is small in stature. That's why he has to climb a tree later on. So he's not quite as prominent as you might expect from his profile. If you like, um, to use modern language, you could say he's both in Jericho a celebrity and a marginal figure. And linked to that is the question of his reputation. Now, it's fair to say um, that Zacchaeus has had a bad press throughout history, or at least Zacchaeus until he meets Jesus has had a bad press. 
Uh, it's kind of assumed that he was a great embezzler uh, and treated people badly. The serious fraud squad would have been really on to him. And that may partly reflect the, the general dislike for tax collectors um, that, that was that's probably been around throughout history, to be honest, uh, that is certainly was around in the time of Jesus. In verse 7, uh, the crowd expressed their disgust that Jesus is talking with this man who is a sinner. But despite that reputation, there's actually no objective proof that he was such a bad character. And I've been thinking a bit about this. Um, sorry, this is a bit of a nerdy kind of disquisition. But if you look in verse 8, that's the key moment where Zacchaeus says, um, half of my goods I give away, and if I have defrauded anybody, I will repay them fourfold. Now, do the maths on that. Give away half your goods, pay back anybody fourfold. Zacchaeus would certainly have worked this out. He was good with figures, and certainly at this stage in his uh, life, he wasn't into over-promising and underperforming. So he could have worked out that he would have he would be able to do this. And if you give away half your wealth, that leaves you with half. If you're going to restore fourfold to anybody uh, who you've defrauded, it's got to come out of that remaining half. That means, I think, um, you can check this later if you like, that the maximum, the absolute maximum of his wealth that had been gained by fraud could only have been one eighth, 12.5%. And if that was the case, that would have left him with absolutely nothing. So I think maybe his reputation was not as bad as it's been made out. And looked at another way, of course, that great act of renunciation does show that he was a person capable of great generosity. So he's got a reputation, but he's not all bad. So Zacchaeus is emerging, when you think about it, as quite a complex person. And that complexity is summed up in his name. The name Zacchaeus means the pure or the innocent one. And you think, wow, Zacchaeus, the pure, the innocent, is this some kind of joke? I'm sure most of the citizens of Jericho of his time would have said, pure, innocent, he is anything but. But when you get to that point in the passage, Jesus calls him by his name, Zacchaeus, apparently without any irony. Maybe the name is a reminder of who this complex personality really is underneath. Or if you put it another way, who he could be once again. And I think that that becomes clear when towards the end of this passage, Jesus says of Zacchaeus, he too is a son of Abraham. Very powerful words. He too is a son of Abraham. He is a part of the family of Israel. Although he works for a foreign power, for the Roman authorities, although he is on the edge, if you like, of Jericho's society, still he is part of God's people, Israel. I'll come back to that a bit later. But I wanted to begin by just giving you that understanding of Zacchaeus as being quite a complex, if you like, quite a conflicted personality. So what happens in this story? Well, you know it, and we've just heard it. Um, there's a big crowd gathered as Jesus enters Jericho. Zacchaeus, because he's short, cannot see, because uh, the crowd's in the way. And then he shows, as I said before, the kind of resourcefulness, um, the inventiveness that uh, seems to be part of who he is and he thinks ahead he thinks ahead he runs ahead he runs ahead to a position where he's worked out that Jesus is going to pass he climbs a sycamore tree so that he is able to see Jesus and I think that that's a sign of uh, Zacchaeus's entrepreneurial spirit if you like coming out there he sees a problem he finds a way to deal with it to his own advantage he climbs this tree to see Jesus and that is where the great encounter 
takes place. Now, up to this point, up to when Jesus meets Zacchaeus, it's a very, very fast-moving narrative. In the uh, the Greek in which the original was written, each of the first seven verses of this chapter begins with the same word, a very little word, but a very important word. The word in Greek, kai, which just means and, 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 and. And then, and then, and then, and then. It's like a child coming home uh, and saying, what's happened on your first day at school? Well, we did this, and then we did this, and then we went there, and then she said that, and then I met someone said, It's kind of breathless. And uh, it's a sign that the plot is moving forward fast. And it's not just moving forward fast through time. The plot is also moving forward through space. Jesus is on a journey. He's on a journey through Jericho, but part of the framing of Luke's gospel, um, in this part of the gospel anyway, is a bigger journey, a great journey that Jesus undertakes from Galilee to Jerusalem. He sets his face towards Jerusalem. And in fact, it's this chapter of Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, is the one where he gets to Jericho, uh, uh, to Jerusalem later at the end of the chapter. But for now, he's passing through Jericho. And so if you like, this is one journey uh, through Jericho within a bigger journey, the journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. And with that in mind, I think... Um, that we can see this little snapshot of a journey through Jericho uh, alongside two other episodes of journeying in Luke's Gospel. And there are parallels in language between all three of these mini journeys and big contrast too. The other two journeys that I'm talking about, um, one is an is a parable, it's not a journey that actually happened but it's a parable that's told the famous story of the good samaritan uh, in luke chapter 10 and then the other right towards the end of the gospel after the resurrection the story of the two disciples meeting jesus on the road to emmaus in chapter 24 so i just want to think briefly about this journey uh, with zacchaeus alongside the good samaritan and alongside the road to Emmaus. Think about the story of the Good Samaritan and immediately the setting should ring bells when you think of it alongside Zacchaeus. Here is Jesus in the Zacchaeus story traveling up from Jericho to Jerusalem. In the story of the Good Samaritan, the travel is in the opposite direction. A man, could be anybody, a man is travelling down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And then on that journey, the opposite kind of interaction happens to what happens in Zacchaeus. What do I mean by that? Well, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, an outsider, a Samaritan, one really on the edge or beyond the edge of society, comes along the road and he looks across and looks down and he sees a man lying by the side of the road, the man who's fallen amongst thieves, and he lifts him up, puts him on his donkey, and helps him physically and provides food and drink and hospitality for him. That's the parable of the Good Samaritan. Here, in the Zacchaeus story, if you like, you could say the roles are reversed. The outsider, the one um, on the edge of society, is Zacchaeus, who is the man by the side of the road. The man on the road is Jesus. He goes over to Zacchaeus uh, and he doesn't need to lift him up because he's high up in the tree. He tells him to come down. He tells that man to come down and from that outsider he receives uh, food and drink and hospitality. 
Now, if you like, things are a little bit the other way round. I'm not quite sure what that means, but think about it. Uh, if you've got any questions, ask Phil later. But it's a very powerful image, that image of Jesus looking up into the tree and saying to Zacchaeus, come down. And Zacchaeus realises to meet his Lord, or as Christians we would say to meet his God, he has to come down to God's level and meet him on the way. He's climbed up to try to find him. God says, come down, I'm down here. You have to climb down the tree to meet me. That's the Good Samaritan um, mini journey. The other one I mentioned was Jesus, uh, after the resurrection, appearing and walking alongside the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. So, of course, to begin with, they don't realise that it is Jesus. And he walks with them, talks with them, uh, expounds the scriptures to them. Wonderful Easter story, a reminder at this time of year that we can just start to begin to, to look ahead in hope to Easter. But particularly... Uh, in that story of the road to Emmaus, at the end, the disciples ask Jesus to stay with them. Uh, the, 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 the night is, the day is over, the night is drawing in. Abide with us, they say. Abide with me, abide with us. And it's the same word, stay, stay in our house, that's used in that Emmaus story, as is used here in the story of Zacchaeus but it's very different uh, way round in the road to Emmaus at first Jesus says no 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 no, no I'm not going to stay uh, but they insist and eventually he does go in and stays with them at their insistence but he doesn't remain long he's made known in the breaking of the bread and he vanishes from their sight but it's them who ask him to stay here in the Zacchaeus story it's the other way around Jesus himself invites himself in quite a peremptory way uh, imagine how you would feel if someone came to you and said i must stay at your house tonight well if you knew it was jesus uh, you might feel differently but it's, it's an unusual um, approach to invitations jesus invites himself to stay but zacchaeus does not refuse of course and in both the emmaus story and in the zacchaeus story jesus entering the house becomes the great sign and the means of blessing and salvation so that's what if you like that's what happens in the story now what's going on uh, can we find a deeper level of what is happening in this encounter of Jesus and Zacchaeus of Zacchaeus and Jesus well I think there are so many strands of meaning that we could draw from this and um, if you are finding those strands yourself then just go ahead and, and, and ignore me because my only wish is that we all sit and read and learn from the scriptures as they speak to us but here's some thoughts from me um, four thoughts really uh, three that belong together from the actual encounter uh, where Jesus and Zacchaeus are standing um, at the sycamore tree uh, and then one from the story as a whole. First of all, um, what's very striking in this story is the, the really kind of straightforward, immediate, no messing nature of Zacchaeus' response to Jesus' call. In verse 5, Jesus says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. And in verse 6, Luke says, Zacchaeus hurried and came down. There's an exact matching of words uh, between what Jesus says and what Zacchaeus does. Words and actions match perfectly. Invitation is exactly mirrored by response. And of course, the other point in the Gospels in which that immediate response happens is the call of the apostles of the Twelve by the lakeside. And as we know, that is the summons to discipleship. 
the apostles by the lake leave their nets leave their father with the hired servants and, and get up and follow Jesus and Zacchaeus uh, responds he doesn't actually follow because Jesus is coming to his house but he responds with the same immediacy uh, and as for the apostles uh, so here when Jesus comes into his life this is the best thing that has happened to Zacchaeus and he responds in the right way it's not like this for everybody in the New Testament and just to remember that what I find really kind of hauntingly sad story that's often set alongside the story of Zacchaeus the story where Jesus meets the rich young man and he says to the rich young man uh, if you would be perfect give away everything you have to the poor and come follow me and the rich young man cannot accept Jesus invitation to give away all that he has and to come and follow him he fails in his response. Zacchaeus, by contrast, his answer is quick and complete and sincere. So it's about discipleship and there is no better choice that anybody can make, whether it's Zacchaeus, whether it's the apostles, whether it's you, whether it's me. There is no better choice that anybody can make in their life than to be a follower of Jesus this is discipleship. And then the second thing I draw out from this is that as he responds in that way, Zacchaeus finds out who he really is, or at least who he really is meant to be. You'll remember that I tried to show how Zacchaeus in Luke's picture is really quite a complex, quite a conflicted personality but somehow in this moment of encounter with Jesus all this falls away and the great marker in the gospel text that gives us the clue that that is happening is one word in verse 8 where it says Zacchaeus stood there or actually the Greek says Zacchaeus standing says um, in a sense the the narrative of the story doesn't need that word that verb it's kind of redundant but it's not because it gives an insight into who Zacchaeus has suddenly become he's got a new confidence that enables him to stand there um, a bit like Martin Luther at the Diet of Worms here I stand I can do no other uh, to stand with confidence before the son of man is a great uh, theme in the gospels and you can do that when you know who you are Zacchaeus now knows who he is Jesus has called into his life to recall him to his true identity out of all his complexity and his internal conflicts Jesus restores him if you like recalls him to who he really is and because it's Jesus's call um, you could say this is vocation um, as we use the word today we don't know what happened to Zacchaeus afterwards after he'd entertained Jesus in his house of course um, early Christian tradition says uh, as it does of the most unlikely of people that he went on to become a bishop uh, I think it also says that he probably became a martyr as well. That happens to a lot of um, characters in the New Testament who you think, well, what happened to them after the resurrection? But we don't know that. It may be that Zacchaeus carried on as a tax collector uh, in, in a good way. What we can be sure of is that he had found out who God wanted him to be and he'd found out what God wanted him to do. And that is what conversion means. And that is what vocation means. And the two are not so different. Uh, in verse 9, it's really interesting. I mentioned this before, but in verse 9, Jesus says very simply, He too was a son of Abraham. 
he too was a son of Abraham. And that's, um, you know, that in a sense, as I said, is saying he's, he's a real Israelite. But son of Abraham, or daughter of Sarah for women, is also the name that is always given to those from a, a non-Jewish background who convert to Judaism. That's the name they're giving you, son of Abraham, daughter of Sarah. Um, so, in a sense, a vocation, a conversion, a restoration, whatever you call it, he's found his identity and his role again within the people of God. Let's call that vocation, um, for reasons that you might be working out why. We've got discipleship, we've got vocation. And thirdly, um, this is good news, not just for Zacchaeus, but for the whole of Jericho. The whole of that city must have rejoiced at Zacchaeus's um, conversion, vacation, restoration, because suddenly his considerable wealth, whether that's from his charitable giving away of the 50% or his restitution of whatever it was, however much percentage it was, his considerable wealth, his money, uh, is flowing in that city society and that must have had an impact and not just Zacchaeus's wealth he is now devoting himself with all his resourcefulness all his entrepreneurial spirit all his imaginative approach he's devoting himself to good works he's become a force not for miserliness but for neighborliness in his society and as he moves from the edge from the kind of back of the crowd to the front to the center there must have been so much healing happening in that society so much bitterness dying away and Jericho that day must have looked a bit more like the kingdom of God than it did the day before and no doubt Zacchaeus will never ever forget that day and he will never stop talking about it to the end of his life and beyond Zacchaeus will be talking about the day that Jesus came into his life and everything changed for him and for those around him and all those things that I've just talked about the sharing of good news the caring for neighbours the reconciling of hatred the building of the kingdom and above all, the telling of the story of God's love in Jesus Christ. All those are the things that we call evangelism. Sometimes people, people think that's a bit of a scary word. It's not. It's just this kind of stuff happening. Zacchaeus becomes an evangelist. Jericho is evangelised. Well, here's a thing. What has come out of this story, about, of this encounter? The things that have come out of this encounter are discipleship and vocation and evangelism. And I honestly promise you, hand on heart, I did not set out uh, when I was thinking about and reading and reflecting and praying about the story of Zacchaeus, I didn't set out to try and find those three things, discipleship, vocation and evangelism in this story. They just came out of it. But I hope you know that they are the priorities for all of us in this diocese. I'll come back to that in a moment. But before that, um, there's one deeper level still that will be easy to miss, not just out of the encounter between Jesus and Zacchaeus in front of the sycamore tree, but out of the story as a whole. A, a, a truth that kind of bookends the whole story and is given away by two words uh, one near the beginning and one near the end. The one near the end is in verse 10. One well, at the end is in verse 10, where Jesus says that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He came to seek, came to search out Zacchaeus. That encounter at the sycamore tree is no chance meeting. Jesus was looking for Zacchaeus but that works the other way too because near the beginning of the story 
and you miss this in the English translation. Near the beginning of the story, when Zacchaeus starts climbing the tree, the English um, translations all say something like, he tried. He was trying to see Jesus, trying to see Jesus. Actually, what the Greek says is he sought to see Jesus. It's the same verb that's used of Zacchaeus looking out for Jesus as is used for Jesus looking out for Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is searching for Jesus just as the other way round. Jesus is searching for Zacchaeus. They are looking for each other. And on the streets of Jericho on that memorable day, their long quest for each other finally reached its joyful fulfilment. So that was Jericho 2,000 years ago. And uh, we're in Staffordshire. You're in Brood and I'm in Lichfield uh, 2,000 years later. Where is the hope for us today in this story? Well, as I said at the beginning, I mean, I hope, I hope if you've been able to engage, or maybe if you've been able to engage with what I'm saying, more importantly, if you've been able to engage with what the gospel text is saying, then the message of hope will fall out fairly easily for you. Um, and find we need to f be addressed by our own word of hope by God. But here's, here's three things for me. Firstly, um, we are pretty much like Zacchaeus, I think. We're complicated. We're conflicted. A lot of the time we're not really sure who we are. We have some good points and we have some not so good points, or to be honest, we have some pretty bad points. But when Jesus comes into our lives and we respond to him, then that opens up to us the opportunity to become focused, to become a unity in ourselves, to become sure of ourselves, of who we are, of what we're meant to do, to be able to stand with confidence like Zacchaeus stood beneath the sycamore tree before the Son of Man. And that can happen to any of us. Zacchaeus, you know, if he was a chief tax collector, would not have been a young man when Jesus met him. It can happen to any of us at any time. So that for me is quite a simple message. When you get fed up with yourself and what a mess you are, as I very often do, get fed up with myself and what a mess I am, never lose hope. This could be the day that Jesus comes into your life like he came into Zacchaeus' life and brings you back to who you're meant to be. And then again, um, as I've said, and not to labour the point because I'm not trying to do product placement here, I'm trying to hear what the scripture says to us, but Jesus, um, uh, Zacchaeus, sorry, in this story, I think Zacchaeus' story really does focus for us those three priorities of discipleship and vocation and evangelism, which we're trying to encourage in every church in our diocese at the moment. They're what we're trying to build up in our church life. Discipleship, vocation, evangelism. Big words, if you like, but it just means f gladly following Jesus, knowing that we are who we are and we have a task that he's given us to do and telling the great good news of what Jesus can do for us or God can do for us in Jesus. Discipleship and vocation and evangelism, we need them all as we follow Christ. And they give hope to us. They give hope to our church. And through us and through our churches, they give hope to our world. And then lastly, underneath this great story uh, of what happens in Jericho, there is a much longer reaching an even greater story of two people looking for each other. God in Jesus is looking for us, looking for you, looking for me, coming to seek and to save the lost as he came to Zacchaeus. And like Zacchaeus, even if we don't always realise it, but like Zacchaeus, we are looking for Jesus 
you and I, each of us, are looking for Jesus. And when we meet, when Jesus quests for us and our quests for him meet, then salvation comes to us and there is joy under the sycamore tree in our lives, whether we're in Jericho or in Brood or indeed in Litchfield. And that's just a reminder and an assurance that our hope rests in the God who loves us and whom we love. And that means that our hope is sure and certain. May the God who sought for and found Zacchaeus, the God whom Zacchaeus sought for and found, may that God seek and save you as you seek for him and may he bring you joy and blessing particularly at this Easter time. Bless you all. Amen. Somebody groan, I stopped and looked into a pool and saw the reflection of a fool. I saw the reflection of a fool. Dragging him by his throat were the collar and the links of a chain on his shoulders, a coat. On his feet, shoes of pain, the coat was strife, the chain was pride. I saw the reflection, and I cried. I saw the reflection, and I cried. Tears for myself, a fool, a man, chained by independence, gripped by despair, so Life was a lot of nonsense, my eyes were closed, but in my mind I saw the reflection, so unkind, I saw the reflection, so unkind, sick of life, scared of death, my days just one. big thank you to Bishop Michael for sharing his thoughts with us on that encounter between Jesus and Zacchaeus. And a big thank you to you for joining us for this latest Brood Awakening this evening. 
I do hope you found the evening to be interesting, encouraging, enjoyable and inspiring. Hopefully there'll be another Brood Awakening in the next couple of months or so. I'm, I'm not sure whether that will be live in church, wouldn't that be great? Or whether it will be online like this one and the last couple have been. But please watch this space for further details. So now let's finish with a prayer of blessing. May the love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. May the power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. And may the joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen. Well, that's just about it. It's the end of the formal awakening for tonight, which means one thing. It's donut time. Looking forward to mine. I hope you're looking forward to yours. God bless you. That is good.